didn't know that October 7 going to happen to them. Well, let's let's ask this a different way. Did Israel know that uh, the Egyptian attack on Yom Kippur in 1973 was going to happen? The answer is yes, of course they knew. They had the intelligence. Um, they were receiving warnings from the King of Jordan. Um, all the information was there. But knowledge isn't knowledge if you can't accept it as reality. And when the Israeli leadership was convinced that there was no way Egypt was going to launch such an attack because it made no sense that Egypt couldn't win the war, that ultimately Israel would win, and therefore Anwar Sadat would never commit to this course of action. So they disregarded the intelligence information, and then the attack came. After that attack, there was a major inquiry, and uh, one of the things they found out is that the reports that were being written by the intelligence collectors uh, never made it to the leadership or they went through a filter and that filter was infected with the, the Israelis called the conception, the conception of this, of this reality. And when the intelligence came in, it didn't conform to this reality. The intelligence was either dismissed or reshaped to pass up to the leadership. So the leadership remained largely ignorant of the reality on the ground. Um, so the Israelis created, in, the, in, in their intelligence system, a position they called the Doubting Thomas. And the Doubting Thomas's job was everything that was being generated from below before it got to a decision maker had to go across his desk. And his job was to challenge every assertion, make sure that they backed it up, that he wasn't going to allow the manipulation of intelligence or the furtherance of unsustained assertion to reach decision maker. If something went to a decision maker, it had to be fact-checked and, and be supportable by you know, viable data. Um, I got to meet this guy. I, I worked uh, with Israeli intelligence from 1994 to 1998. And on the issue of Iraq and Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, I, I got to meet him. We talked about the viability of Saddam. We talked about what Iraq was doing. Um, I helped empower him to be even more um, restrictive on the intelligence flow. So much so that um, Iraq went from being the number one threat to Israel in 1994 to being about number six or number eight in 1998. Uh, and one of the reasons why that happened is that uh, thanks to the doubting Thomas, the Israeli intelligence service had to do a complete reassessment of Saddam Hussein. And he went from being an irrational dictator seeking to destroy Israel to a rational player who could be who, who Israel could learn to live with so long as the weapons of mass destruction programs uh, were eliminated and Israel was buying into the effectiveness of the UN weapons inspector. So the doubting Thomas had a very important role, um, but then we started getting to the buildup towards 9-11. Um, and then after 9-11, what, what Israel found out was that the if you want to take action, the United States wanted to take action against Saddam. Remember, the, uh, the British were told to fix the intelligence to the conclusion. The conclusion is that Saddam has weapons. Fix the intelligence to that was the British direction. For their intelligence service. The CIA was pretty much told the same thing. James Clapper admits that when he was the head of the geospatial intelligence organization, the guys who do photo interpreting, that you know his organization um, saw what they wanted to see. You know, so they looked at a photograph and instead of seeing what the photograph showed, they made it, it they made the photograph do what they wanted it to do, that their prejudice influenced that and that they put in deeply fundamentally flawed intelligence into the system to promote the idea of weapons of mass destruction. In Israel, Israel had you know Benjamin Netanyahu and had intelligence leaders that felt that the Downing Thomas in that system was too restrictive, that the intelligence community was limiting the political options of Israel's political leaders, that there needed to be more flexibility. If you remember, and we had that same problem in the United States, Douglas Fife created this uh, special unit in the Pentagon whose job was to cherry pick intelligence to create a narrative supportive of the Iraq had weapons, of, has weapons of medicine, and Iraq was linked to 9-11. Theory uh, that deviated fundamentally from what the actual intelligence showed. Well, the Israeli intelligence, the new intelligence leaders wanted that flexibility, so they did away with the doubting Thomas. They did away with them. And now you have a situation where Israel begins to repoliticize its intelligence. And that's one thing that Israel, when I worked with them, they would never do. Their intelligence was above reproach. It wasn't always right, 
It's okay. Intelligence is just human beings. Human beings make mistakes. The Israelis made mistakes just like everybody. But it was beyond reproach. It was done. If a mistake was made, it was a mistake made in good faith, uh, as opposed to uh, promoting or promulgating a lie, an outright lie. Uh, now the Israelis were promulgating lies. They lied about saying that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. How do I know it's a lie? Because I worked with them for four years and they knew what the truth was. They decided to put that inconvenient truth aside and start promoting things that they knew were false because they wanted to facilitate an American strike against Iraq that would remove Saddam Hussein from power because that became politically possible now with a new American leadership. Um, so now you have this corrupt system in place. And once again, the conception emerges where political leaders begin to conceive the world they want, not the world that is. And when it comes to Hamas, which, of course, uh, Israel helped fund and create, um, Israel always operated under the notion that Hamas was a tool to be controlled by Israel, and that one of the ways to control Hamas was through economic incentives. And in the lead up to the um, October 7th attack, uh, Israel had opened up uh, the crossings and allowed Gazans to come out, I think several thousand of them, give them work permits, come into Israel, work, earn an income, and bring that money back into Gaza, uh, which helped the Gazan economy. Not, not fundamentally. I mean, we're talking about, this is how narrow-minded the Israelis are. They think that they could buy off the Gazan population through through you know a, 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 tri a, a trickle of money, economic incentive. But the conception was Hamas, having allowed these work permits to go in, wouldn't do anything to disrupt that, because if Hamas did something to disrupt that, the Gazan people would turn on Hamas. That was the conception in the Israeli leadership. And so as in the lead up to October 7th, you have the Israeli collectors on the ground. They're collecting the data. Uh, the Israelis are very good at intelligence collection. Very good. They have human networks. They have the electronic surveillance monitoring phone calls. They have the satellite photos. They have video cameras everywhere. They are taking photos and it all comes in. But one of the things that happened too, because now you've taken the human element out of it, is that the Israelis started, it's a tremendous amount of data. I mean, I, I remember when I was in the Marine Corps, um, I was a combat intelligence officer. And, you know, war is a complicated thing, but, you know, like anything, you simplify it down to what you need to know, the essential elements of information <laughs> so that you can in a timely fashion, assess, evaluate, and make recommendations so that the OODA loop, that decision-making cycle, observe, orient, or decide, um, act, that you're inside the enemy's decision-making cycle, that the enemy is reacting to you and you will ultimately win. Um, that's the way modern maneuver warfare works. The Marine Corps created something called the Surveillance Reconnaissance Intelligence Group. They consolidated it all together, which is okay. I, I, I understand the, the thinking behind it except then they started pouring data in because now you have this group and it's not just some dumb Lieutenant in a battalion with a Lance Corporal and a staff Sergeant and a map with acetate, you know, getting radio things and, and, and feeding off of that, you know, no, that worked by the way, we won wars doing this. No, now we have, you know, a bunch of Marines together in a air conditioned tent um, receiving, you know, internet based flow of data. And they're sitting at a screen reviewing the data. It's too much data. How do you begin to process this? Uh, and and they're, they're flowing it. And so now decisions become more complicated because now the commander thinks he can ask questions that really aren't that relevant, but he can throw questions out there, get answers. And the thing complicates. It slows down. It gels. It becomes just stupid. Platoon commanders used to lead the old-fashioned way. Get up front and die. I mean, sorry, that's what a lieutenant's job is in war. It's what a captain's job is in war. Lead by the front. And if you die, hopefully there's someone there who can replace you. You've trained your staff sergeant, your gunnery sergeant well. And if they die, you got a sergeant that can do over. That's what a well-trained unit does. I was watching you know, a video of, of platoon commanders in Afghanistan in a firefight, in a firefight with a laptop computer open, writing reports. Like, what the hell are you doing? Get up, get out, and lead. Go to your forward elements. Call in the airstrikes. Find out what's going on. Dispatch. Lead by example. That's not how we lead anymore, man. We got a computer, and we're sending reports back, and we're receiving intelligence information. 
I mean, that's that's what's happened here is we've decentralized this thing. We've complicated this thing. So the Israelis now paralysis by analysis, too much information coming in. So they created an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm that was programmed to receive this information and deliver probable outcomes what Hamas would do, what could happen, what potentials are. So all this data is going in, all these humans are putting in this data, but the ultimate say, which used to be a guy like me handing it off to the doubting Thomas who would review it using the human brain, the best supercomputer in the world right here, right here. And he would say, no, no, check, check, come back. Now it goes to a computer, which has an algorithm designed to generate a response. The computer algorithm is not designed to say, BS, go back and do it again. <laughs> it's designed to go click, 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 and here's a response, and the people give it. The Israelis were bragging about it. They, I think in 2021, they did a uh, short little fight in Gaza, and they called it the first artificial intelligence war, where everything was done by artificial intelligence. The targeting's done. They, they, they can overlay, and we saw this. The Israelis have talked about it. They overlay um, you know, addresses, homes, where people live, they overlay it and they can come in with a target. They can drop bombs here to achieve the certain results, etc. Everything's done with artificial intelligence. And so you have these young girls, because a lot of these units along uh, the border are staffed by young girls. We saw that. We saw the videos of those girls cowering in the, uh, in the bunker. And tragically, most of them died when Hamas came in. Many of them were captured and taken hostage. One was released recently. Others are still being held. These girls, their job is to sit again in an office, but they they just monitor, they monitor the cameras and they write reports. They can also do things just so people stop feeling sorry for them. They uh, they can control these remote controlled uh, machine guns uh, so that if Hamas comes through the gate, they can sit there like a joystick, and fire on them and kill them. So they they are combatants. Um, but they're sitting there watching and writing reports, going, "Hey, these guys are rehearsing an attack on this kibbutz." They've built a model of this kibbutz and they're rehearsing an attack. They send the report in. It goes into the computer. The conception says, no, nope, Hamas wants that money coming in and prints it out. And the leadership goes, ah, nah, don't worry about it. Dismissive. They're, they're monitoring everything. Everybody's around. They're monitoring everything. The human intelligent networks are coming back. Hey, guys, this is serious. We're getting reports from within. This is serious. The intercepts, this is serious. The visual, this is serious, all there, up to the point where they literally wrote a report on October 6th saying Hamas is going to attack tomorrow, a major attack. Hamas is coming over the fence tomorrow, which should have had a watch officer go cancel all leaves, red alert, red alert, red alert, you know, man, the FBF, get, get everybody online, get everybody up, get them out there on the wire, get everything up and running, get the helicopters up, get the airplanes up, get everything ready for when they come across. Repel borders. Nope. Instead, they went, ah, oh, let's call in the leadership. They say they're coming over tomorrow. Yeah, but what about the Concepcion? What's the computer say? The computer says, don't worry about it. Let's go to sleep. We'll talk about it in the morning. That was the decision that was made. Let's go to sleep. We're not going to cancel leaves. It's a holiday. Let the people stay at home. Let's not disrupt the family celebrations. Um, let's not wake people up. They're all sleeping. Just we'll talk about it in the morning. The morning came. It was too late. Hamas was over the wire. Boom. It's done. Was this deliberate? Because that's the theory right now. Because, I mean, <laughs> on the one hand, it's inexcusable because there's no doubt that they had the intelligence. Is this a deliberate act? Did the Israelis let this happen? I firmly believe no. 